Hi, Mrs. V here. Today we are going to talk about ionisation energy and metal reactivity. So let's get our whiteboard on and get started. Ionisation energy. The definition is fairly tricky sounding definition. The first ionisation energy, there are second and third and fourth and so forth. It's the energy required to remove Let's make that remove. One mole of the most loosely held electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state. And it's measured in kilojoules per mole. What does that mean? Simply means if you've got a metal, we're just going to take any old metal, M. And that metal is going to lose an electron. And the amount of energy that's required for that is called ionization energy. So it's just the energy needed to take an electron from an atom. So you can see immediately that that is going to have some impact on metal reactivity because metals react by losing electrons. So the easier it is to get that electron off of the metal atom, the more reactive the metal is going to be. So ionization energy, I'm not going to ask you to be repeating that definition. What's more important is that you understand it's a measure of how easily an atom loses an electron. And that's technically talking about the valence or the outer shell electrons. So the lower the ionization energy, the easier it is for the atom to lose an electron. So a really reactive metal loses electrons easily and it will have a low ionization energy. There is periodic variation in this, and I'm sure you'll remember from our studies of electronegativity how things vary um, across the periodic table. Let's have a look, though. You'll see that generally ionization energy decreases as you go down a group. And you'll see that ionization energy increases as you go across a period. There are a few little anomalies. There are points where that doesn't hold true. For instance, if you look at going from magnesium to aluminium, that doesn't follow the trend. And I've actually put up some videos to explain why there are those anomalies. So have a look at those if you're interested. All right, so down a group, you get a decrease. So the most reactive metals are found at the bottom of the group. And if we look for left to right across a period, we get an increase. And so the most reactive metals are further to the left. Why, what is it though that is influencing this? Well, there are three things here that influence the ionization energy. There's the charge on the nucleus, the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons, and inner electron shielding. So let's look at the charge on the nucleus. So the more protons there are in the nucleus, the bigger the attraction for the outer shell electrons.
So that means they're going to be more strongly held. And that's going to mean you're going to have a higher ionization energy. And for a metal, that means it's not going to lose its electrons very easily. And if it doesn't lose electrons equally, that means it's not very reactive. So the charge on the nucleus, obviously, as you go left to right across the period, the charge on the nucleus increases. Now, our second point is the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons. And that's, as you go left to right across the period, that's mostly pretty much the same. The elements do shrink a little bit because of the charge on the nucleus. It does suck the outer shells in a little bit closer. But generally, if you're looking left to right across a period, you can consider the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons to be reasonably the same. It's down a group that this really matters. Down a group, every time you go down one level on a group, then you've got an extra shell of electrons. And that means that the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons is much larger. The further those electrons are away from the nucleus, the less the attraction is between the nucleus and the valence electrons, and that means you're going to lose those electrons much more easily. There's going to be a much lower ionization energy. So you're going to find, therefore, low ionization energies at the bottom of a group, and that's why those metals are really, really reactive. Shielding by inner electrons, if you imagine those electrons down the bottom of the group, there's not only are they a long way away from the nucleus, but they also have this big bank of negative charge in between them, and that makes the attraction even smaller for the nucleus. And that is known as the shielding effect. So that means that there's going to be even lower ionization energy at the bottom of a group. So all of that 
goes together to say low ionization energy. I should say lower. The further down the group you go. And that means that the metals are much more reactive at the bottom of a group than they are further up. Now, there's not, we've been talking about first ionization energies. There's actually first, second, third, and so forth ionization energies. So your first ionization energy is the one we talked about before, where your metal loses one electron. The second ionization energy is for the next electron coming off. So that's, you've already lost one electron, so it's already the metal iron. But it loses its second electron. And then the third ionization energy would be that one that's already lost two electrons, losing another electron. Remember, every time it loses an electron, it gets another positive charge and so on and so forth, that that keeps going and going and going. And you can actually work out which group of the periodic table something's in by the size of those first, second, and third valence, uh, uh, sorry, ionization energies. If we have a look at this table, we've got the successive ionization energies. So this is your first one. This is your second, third, fourth, etc, etc, etc. Now if we look at sodium, sodium's first ionization energy is quite low. That, so that means sodium going to sodium ions and electrons, that's a low ionization energy. If we try and go one further, so if we try and take another electron, there's a huge jump. It goes from 496 for this one, kilojoules per mole, through to 4,000, 4,560. So it's a huge jump. If we look at sodium's electronic configuration, we can get a bit of an idea why that might be. Oops. So we have the 1s, the 2s, and then the 2p for those, and then the 3s. Sodium at number 11 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's sodium. So if we lose the uh, valence electron in the 3s, so if we're going to lose this one, what's left? Na plus has a noble gas configuration. So it's gonna be really hard. You're gonna need a lot of energy to break that. So we know sodium's in group one because it's easy to get, the, it's easy for it to lose its first electron, but after that, it's gonna be very, very difficult to lose that second electron. And that's why we have that huge second ionization energy. But if you look at magnesium, magnesium, the first one's very small. 
and let's have a look at magnesium. So for magnesium to go to mag magnesium one plus with an electron, that doesn't take much energy. It's pretty easy to get that electron off. It's actually a little bit more difficult to get the second electron off. So that's easy. This one's reasonably easy. But have a look what happens then for magnesium for the two plus ion to lose an electron to become three plus. This is really difficult. There's a big jump in ionization energy between the second and the third, and therefore we know that magnesium is in group two. We look at aluminium, the next one down, we see the big jump in ionization energy for aluminium occurs after the third ionization energy. So the fourth is a huge jump from 2000 up to 11,000. So we know aluminium's in group three. So that's the relationship between the ionization energies and being able to tell which group something's in. That'll do for today. I will see you guys in the next video.